Hey everybody, the following is an interview with Unity CEO John Riccatello. I had an opportunity to talk to him on May 2nd at Game Dev Guild and do a full interview where I got to ask him a lot of questions about the future of Unity and also a lot about what he sees going on with AI and AI and game development. All right. Hey, John, it is great to see you again. Oh, I like the view out the office window there. I can see that. That is very cool. How are you doing today? Good morning. Great to see you again. Yeah, it is very great to see you. I was trying to find you at GDC, but I know you're super popular and way too too busy. Too many people wanted to talk to you. So it was, uh, I had a great time there, by the way, and I got to see the office. Freaking awesome. I, I really loved it. And I had a good view of the office from uh, from the hotel. Got a lot of pictures of people hanging out up there. A lot of fun. So anyway, I don't want to waste time. I want to get right into um, asking you some of the big questions because you're the guy with all, all of the answers. And the first one was about something that seemed a little controversial earlier in the year, something that I saw a lot of people talking about and asking questions about and a little bit confused about, which was the CTO switch. So a couple months ago, there was an announcement that there's a new CTO at Unity. And a couple people had no idea what it was. Thought it was like some weird corporate takeover or other random conspiracy <laughs> ideas. But I got to talk to people and I have a, a much better understanding of w what was going on there. But I think that the world would love to hear from you um, just a little bit about what the decision was, wh where um, Luke came in, and uh, what's going on there. All right, so um, first off, before I go anywhere with the switch part, let me tell you that, um, actually I spoke to Joachim this morning, and so um, he's got to be one of my favorite people that's ever walked the planet. And um, he's unrivaled for intensity. Uh, when a subject appeals to him and he's focused on it. Um, he can also brute force him way, his way through writing more code than any human alive. And so um, to say I admire uh, Joachim would be a staggering understatement. Um, he's, he's frankly just incredible. Now, after more than a decade and a half of uh, you know, pounding out code for Unity, uh, he needed a break, and so he's on sabbatical right now. And so, um, you know, that's sort of part of the answer, but it's also not the complete answer, to be honest. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background on Luke Bartolet. Um, I met Luke uh, in the mid '90s. Um, he had he'd, he'd been part of Maxis, part of Electronic Arts. Um, he is a unbelievably deep technologist, but he also has an enormous breadth to his skill set, his perspective and understanding. And so um, when I thought about you know, successor CTOs, I, I thought back on the reason I brought Luke into Unity originally. At the time, he was on a multi-year sabbatical himself, um, circumnavigating the, the globe on a boat, um, having <laughs> children while at it. Um, you know, one of those <laughs> stories that I wish I'd found time to live in my life, but nonetheless. and <laughs> I have to say, one of the things that people probably don't appreciate is, you know, a big part of Unity, in particular for this community of people that will be watching this, this uh, interview, um, Dots is a big part of Unity, uh, the data-oriented technology stack, ECS, those things that we're doing there. And the vast majority of, of all games ever built, in fact, vast majority, meaning 99.9% .9 probably, are based on object-oriented programming systems and, and that approach to developing games. There are very few... Um, technologies or, or engines of the past that have ever really used what amounts to the current Unity Entity Component System that is in DOTS. One game that did build that way was The Sims. And so um, Luke was the development director and the head of studio on that project. Back before it was released in 2000, back in the late 90s. And so um, aside from the enormous breadth that he brings, an understanding of things from you know AI to large data systems, neural networks, um, rendering systems, and the rest, he has depth in an area that is particularly important to Unity. And so um, he's also got uh, two and a half decades involved in the actual production of very successful games. Some not so successful, but quite a few that are very successful. And I thought that that combination of having shipped so many games, being deep 
on the data-oriented technology stack, understanding how is, you know, a GPU and a CPU works down at the microcode level, really in-depth understanding, knowing Unity, still coding today. Um, you know, those were some of the reasons um, that I thought he'd be great, great for Unity, and he's French, and so at least we have one similarity, aside from them both being deeply te technical, is he's another European to helm the technology team at Unity. Nice. Well, I am excited to see how things change and uh, what new stuff happens. I, I heard tons and tons of great stuff about Luke, and I, I'm really excited about it. And I think that it probably alleviate some of the the weird concerns that people had. And people have to remember that, like, so when you work on something for a long time, you want to take a break. You want to do something new every now and then. And uh, now I kind of want to go sailing around with, and and I already have a bunch of kids, but maybe I uh, take them sailing around. <laughs> Well, ask, ask, Luke his, ask Luke about his interaction with pirates while he was uh, cruising around on that boat. It might change your mind. But yeah, uh, now I'm a little bit <laughs> a little bit more hesitant already. All right, let's go on to the the next question. This is one of the the big ones that I've been really wanting to ask you about. I'm kind of curious, and I think a, a lot of people will. Uh, well, I don't know. Hopefully, be excited to hear the answer. I don't know what the answer is, though. Um, I'm really curious what your bigger, long-term, like five-year plan for Unity as a company is, and and kind of uh, what you see with the industry as a whole. Because I think that you've seen everything, and you, you've been able to kind of call out a lot of stuff before it happened. And and I, I think that your insights are probably some of the best. And you. You should know the most, right? So, w what are the long-term plans for Unity? What do, What are you thinking in a in just the game development industry in general? So, um, God, there's a lot to cover here. So, <laughs> as it, it turns up at a high level, before I get into anything specific, um, think of Unity as being, you know, our ambition is to be your game engine team, to be to build a product in, in our game engine that enables creators to realize their dreams. And we realize that you know, we're way more a developer's tool than an artist's tool. And one of the things that we want to accomplish is to be better for the artists as well as you know, the coders and developers. And so we're working on ways to make Unity more friendly to the artists. I mean, you know, today, I'm guessing um, most of your developers have, you know, that are watching this have this experience. They've got a... a, a a game designer or a um, you know somebody that's got a vision for what they want to do, and they want to get that vision in white box, for example, into Unity. And instead of being able to do that themselves, um, they go find their favorite developer and they stand behind them and say, "Do this, do that, do this, do that." Um, in order to, to to get that first realization in 3D, something that's mildly interactive that addresses what they want, we want to collapse that to a situation where it's just a lot easier to do. And so um, we're trying to be more powerful, more extensible, cover more use cases, you know, get better at blending that combination of model behavior and dots, and also be more welcoming to artists. So continue to improve. Now remember, you know, a, a substantial majority of all games in the world are built today on Unity. We, we're both proud and humbled by that fact, and we're working really hard for Unity to be um, easier to use, more powerful, and address more you know, use cases so that all of those listening to me today can realize their dreams in Unity. Now, um, a couple of things that I would add to that. Um, yes, we, we work outside of gaming, um, but our, our heart and soul and love is in the gaming industry. Um, what we do outside of gaming helps us be better at gaming. Um, and I could talk about that if we want to talk about it today, but maybe not. The second thing I tell you is, you know, it feels a little bit cloudy out there in the game industry right now. Um, you know, recent reports have said console gaming had its first decline 3% year over year in the recent quarter um, compared to prior, the first decline in nine years. This should not surprise us. You know, the game industry on the console side always declines, you know, three, four, five years into a cycle before new hardware comes out. I'm not here to pre-announce anybody's new hardware, but I am going to tell you when when we get when these these cycles get longer in the truth, you know, you know, consumers, players stop buying as much stuff, you know, sort of anticipating that there'll be new stuff to buy later. That's the second thing that's super important. And the third thing, and I know we're gonna gonna talk on it, talk about it. Let me go back to that for a second, though. And so, you know, I definitely see um, 
a, a lot of reasons for optimism. A statistic that um, everyone might not know unless they read our industry report is that DAUs, daily average you know, users, the number of people that are playing games, and the amount of time they're playing is up. And this is up against the year ago comparison where um, everyone was at home, you know, nursing some version of, you know, work from home, study from home, COVID melees. And so it's astonishing that it's up in comparison to a period of time, sort of the wave two COVID thing that took, took the world by storm about a year ago. So um, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And I'm super optimistic about the industry. So if you're a game developer, you're in the right industry. This is going to continue to grow, which leads me into my third point. And I, and I think we're going to want to talk a little bit about it today. Um, I believe that what we're reading about today and what we're deeply involved in at Unity today around AI is, a, is probably the most profoundly important um, new inflection point around technology that I've seen in my gaming career. Now, my gaming career goes back a ways. It, it, it involves, you know, GPUs becoming more powerful and enabling the first 3D gaming. Yes, I was here where everything <laughs> was 2D. And um, it became 3D in the mid and late 90s. Um, and that was a hard thing for the transition of people creating games. Because at the time, not everyone could master C++ and, you know, really imagine and live in a 3D gaming world. And a lot of people dropped out, given the, you know, the harshness of that transition. And shortly after that, I mean, it sounds crazy, but the internet came alive. And we suddenly had to do things online. And that was another challenge. And you know, several years later, we saw mobile. And mobile was yet another opportunity and challenge. And my sense is AI is a big enough subject to be perhaps as important as all three of those combined. And so... There's a reason I am super optimistic as opposed to pessimistic um, about you know, what AI offers in our world. And I want to make sure, we want to make sure that in addition to being the best game engine, your game engine team, if you will, around the points I made, mentioned a few minutes ago, that we're also here to provide everyone that uses the Unity platform a, uh, the right and best way to interact with AI to make their careers better and their games better. I'm glad that you brought that up. Well, first, I, I want to mention that that games report, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to send out an email. Everybody go check that out. It was very interesting. I was surprised by some of the stuff in there. But on the AI side, it's been one of the key things that I've been thinking about for the last uh, few months at least. And I've been really trying to figure out how it's going to change um, game development, software development, and the world as a whole. I think that it's going to be much bigger than a lot of people think. I, I think that every, but most people I talk to disagree, and and I uh, think I uh, think I'm crazy and overestimate the impact that it's going to have. But I'm already seeing a big impact day to day in the stuff that I do, just with the stuff that's available publicly right now. So I'm really curious. Um, without spoiling anything you're not allowed to talk about, do you have thoughts on um, what devs or what people who are getting into game development or already doing game development should be thinking about or looking at when it comes to AI to make sure that they're not falling behind, that they're kind of taking advantage of it and staying at the top and not um, being maybe replaced by AI or being replaced by developers who are using AI properly when they're not? So yeah, I got lots of thoughts, but... Um, I'll start with a, 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 very, a very simple framing. Um, what impact is AI going to have on the gaming industry? So one is going to be on the creation process itself. And um, I think we'll, we'll talk about why this is true, but developers are going to, that use AI are going to find themselves wildly more productive. They can create more, realize more. And so you mentioned the sentence a minute ago, and this is going to be provocative, and some people are going to hate me for this, but you know, a developer that um, won't, in my opinion, be replaced by AI, maybe ever, but a developer may be replaced by a better developer that uses AI. So if it can make you more productive, and let's, we'll talk specifically about how and why it will make people more productive, but that's one area. So you know, I'm here to tell you, I'd encourage you to learn about AI tools because I think it's going to be an important part of the development process. Um, but I don't think it takes away 
from um, a creator's artistry. And, and again, I want to talk about that. So that's one general subject area we could spend, you know, four hours on or six hours on if we wanted to. And Unity is doing a lot of work in this area. But the creative process, the, the development process of a game is going to be pretty profoundly impacted by AI. The, the, second, the second area is AI will enable creators to make things they never imagined possible before. Things that are cooler and in many ways better. And um, part of what I like about that is that games that I've had in my mind were game, you know, game worlds that I've had in my mind that were never possible before, um, you know, sort of inference engines, neural networks, you know, different aspects of AI are going to be possible now. And I think earlier I'd mentioned things that were disruptive in the gaming industry, like GPUs, you know, challenging people to get to 3D, the internet and mobile. One of the things that all of those things did is they, they separated successful and unsuccessful companies and individuals in the industry in a pretty hard way. But they also led to doubling and triple of the industry each time those technology inflection points you know, were ingested by the industry. In other words, they brought innovation and innovation brought growth. And so I believe that what AI promises in the sense that you can make things you never could have made before, um, those things are going to drive these, these new types of game development, these new types of games that players are going to enjoy. They're going to double or triple our industry again. And we're already the biggest medium in the world. We're going to be orders of magnitude bigger than we are now eventually. But my sense is we're going to see an acceleration in growth in 24, 25, 26, as AI becomes a part of virtually every game out there, at least not virtually every game, but leading innovative games out there. They're going to drive a lot of growth, which is great for the industry. And so I'm, I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I personally, I am too. I'm a little bit concerned about the developers who are... Um just kind of downplaying it and thinking that it, that it's not going to make an impact. But I, I think that they'll probably all realize it once uh, a lot of the tools and, and things that start to take advantage of AI become a little bit more widespread and a little bit more talked about and become more released. Like uh, you know, we were talking earlier about using GitHub Copilot. I think a lot of developers still don't use that. And you know, it's one of the many, many things that can speed stuff up. So I'm a little curious um, on the Unity side. Or does Unity have any specific plans for um, AI-related things that um, we should know about that are coming in the near future? There was that little teaser at GDC that kind of gave some ideas and put some thoughts in people's head about what kinds of things may be coming. And I've seen a little inside stuff, but I don't like to talk about it because I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. So if there's anything you can uh, share, I think people would love to hear it. So, um, yes, and we have a lot. And um, I'm not going to try to make this, this, you know, this, this, this interview be a marketing campaign for Unity Tools. I'm going to talk really about what I think every developer may want to consider more so than, you know, flog and blog, say, hey, buy this from us. But we've been, in, we've been, in, we've been working on AI tools at Unity now for five years, um, probably longer. And there's a number of AI tools embedded in the Unity Editor for content creation already. And you're going to see a lot more. And I want to come back to that after making another point. The other thing is, remember, for those of you who probably don't know, Silvio Druin is part of, part of Unity. But I can remember almost five and a half years ago, and as these things are, we were in a bar together and we started talking about AI and the runtime, in the Unity runtime. And based on that conversation of us fantasizing about what could be in games. Um, we started, he was running Unity Labs at the time. We started and funded and put people against a project called Project Barracuda at Unity. And what that's about, and we announced it a year ago, it was three and a half, four years in development at that point, which was um, an inference engine inside the runtime, which will enable um, different types of games that are dramatically better, in my opinion, than games that are produced today. And that's an exciting area. So um, I think it might be interesting to talk about those both separately. 
um, and, and maybe start um, with the creator's journey, what a creator does, a developer does, and how AI is important. Um, if you want to flip to that, we can. Yeah, I think that that would be very, very helpful for everybody because everybody here is creating games. And I, I've found the AI stuff, like I said, be extremely beneficial. It's making a huge difference for me. So if we can talk a little bit about that, I think people would be very interested. And then I had uh, one other question, but go ahead. So, so let's start in the creator's process. So um, I've read about how AI is going to replace um, game developers and, and, and game designers. It, it, it makes me crazy because it's not smart. Um, I think they imagine that, that some civilian um, that's played three games is going to sit down in front of their PC and have a three-hour conversation with a GPT chat product, you know, probably you know, chat GPT or something else, Bard, pick what you want. And after three hours of describing the game they want, it's going to spit out GTA 6 or it's going to spit out, <laughs> um, you, know, it, you know, sort of a, a candy crush killer or it's going to spit out, you know, something that's, that's the next C and C or it's going to spit out something that, you know, the world wants. And that's just not going to happen. It just, it just isn't really ever going to happen. Now, can somebody make a clone of Flappy Birds that way? Yes. Um, I don't think we're really threatened by a clone of, of, of Flappy Birds. So, and by the way, Flappy Birds, you know, pretty cool. But again, that's not the, the threat on the horizon. So the reason that's not going to happen is because whether it's a game or it's a movie or it's any other large entertainment project, there's a lot of professionals involved that are experts at lighting or experts at physics or level designers or character designers or animators or you know people that are working on you know compulsion loops inside of a game and I mean that in a positive way, which makes you want to do the next thing. And it's a you know the, the best of games is a collision of brilliantly creative people working in parallel to produce something. And that that process is invariably iterative. They make something, and that something is pretty good, but it's not good enough. And they, they, maybe they're trying to get to a vertical slice, and they produce more, and they produce more, and they finally get to a vertical slice, and it still sucks, and they work on making it feel alive in your hand with a controller until it's worth playing. And that iterative process, I think, has a humanity to it that I don't believe is going to go away. Now, let me, let me pull aside for a minute and... and and give you a little metaphor, there are comparisons relevant. Um, I write a note every Sunday to everyone at Unity about kind of what's on my mind. It's, you know, this past week was about, you know, artists and, and what creators do. And sometimes it's about AI and sometimes it's about a game that I played, but it's always something about, you know, I try to make us feel a little bit like the Unity family. And, you know, this is a little bit of light Sunday reading. And you know, one of the things that I tried to do in my Sunday note maybe a month ago was to see if I could get ChatGPT to write it for me. Now, that's sort of <laughs> pathetic in a way. Um, and it actually wrote a pretty good letter that, that I could have sent to people. I didn't. I could have. But I tell you, at its very best, I'd spent like, it only takes back an hour to write, maybe two hours to write my Sunday note. About four hours in of prompting and reprompting and all the things I got out of it. I still needed, if I wanted to use it, I still needed to bring it into Word or a Google Doc and edit it significantly. Now, that's a really important point. Um, I don't think any of, anyone believes that you're going to get a first draft or even a tenth draft out of an AI tool that you're just ready to use. And so think about it as um, the tool I would bring it into, uh, Word or a Google Doc, is a deterministic tool. Every time I input a, a, a letter K, I get a letter K. Every time I hit return, I, I get the same exact answer. It's deterministic in that regard. When I put something into a natural language editor or an natural language large language model, it's not deterministic. I don't know what the hell I'm going to get out of it. Now, it could be smart. It could be clever. It could bring a lot of really useful things together, and it does. But I expect that virtually all productive use of AI in content creation is going to involve that sweet interplay of natural language, large language models, you know, producing code or 
producing art or producing animation, together with deterministic editing tools that allow you to make it better, to fit it into the overall schema. Whether that person is working with a lighting tool or they're working you know, with physics or they're working on level design or they're working on characters. And that combination, I think, will live for a very long time and teams will live for a very long time and iteration will happen for a very long time before great products are in the hands of, of players. And so, you know, what, what I think you can imagine from us in the years to come is an editor that is easier to use that blends all of our deterministic tools with natural language interfaces where you can do both. And whether you're, you're working on, you know, editing an animation or you're working on, you know, creating a, a script, you can do within the engine, but you can go back and forth between um, natural language tools and deterministic tools to yield the outcome now that you're after. Now, another sort of bad metaphor, we've got some great technical artists at Unity. And, you know, I go to, you know, like Huggy Face and I put in, you know, give me a picture of this famous person in the style of you know, Andy Warhol. And I get something out of that. And it, to me, it's pretty damn cool. But I'm not an artist. Um, what a real artist does is they, they take um, several of these tools. They might create 100 images. And from that 100 images, they might composite 20 of them together. They might use you know, the, the, the hand input tools to edit parts of it. They might re-enter that into a tool for further editing. What they're using is that back and forth tension between natural language and the tool they're used to, deterministic and large language models to get a better outcome. And yes, they are more productive. You know, I was talking to one of our art directors here who tells me that he's able to produce in four hours what used to take a month. And so wow. that's pretty amazing, you know, four hours versus a month. Um, but it didn't, it didn't, in any way, shape, or form, at any point in that creative process, have him believe that the AI was going to take his job. He was using that these tools like a conductor of an orchestra. Now, I was using the tools like the only person in the orchestra was a bugle player with three buttons, and I only had one tune. Right, and what I got back from it, he found laughably um, lacking, because. As an artist, I'm lackingly, I'm, I'm surprisingly lacking. It's not my thing. I'm not good at it. And so I'm not going to get a great outcome because I'm not an artist. The artists are going to do that. And that's the same with code. But, you know, already you said you're using Copilot. You know, we've got, you know, quite a few people here at Unity using Copilot. And they're finding themselves substantially more productive than they were. The amount of code that we're checking in, you know, using Copilot is substantial. We are getting better and faster because of it. So what I'm describing is a world where regardless of your particular function in the creative process, um, using these tools offers the promise of being more productive. And I think you're going to find if you're a Unity developer, we're not only going to be at the bleeding edge, we're probably going to lead the bleeding edge in bringing you the capability so you can do that inside of Unity. And there's a lot of announcements in the next, in the next couple of months Imagine it against the, the vision or the thesis that the right place to do this stuff is inside the editor because it's there that you've got the deterministic tools. And what you're going to want is that conjuring capability of a natural language tools, maybe to give you a first draft on your creativity. Yeah, I think that um, you've kind of nailed it there and sl slightly changed my mind because, to be honest, I was a little bit concerned about developers just uh, not so much losing their jobs, but not having as many opportunities because if one person can do, you know, for a month's worth of work in four hours, then they may not need to hire another person to come, come help with all that stuff. Um, but then it did remind me of back in the day, I mean, before we had even editors available, when everybody was writing their own stuff from scratch or you know, using tools like uh, access to put in data into games. And things have gotten drastically easier, and it's just scaled up the uh, the size of the industry. We're making way more games, way more awesome stuff instead of scaling back. So I'm uh, much more optimistic now, I, I should say. Um, I, I did want to, well, we've got a couple questions in here from the audience, got uh, quite a few of them, but I was curious. Um, oh, let's just go on to this one. It says, is Unity jumping on the AI bandwagon right now because everyone is? And 
is the AI is AI the new metaverse? Should we kind of expect it to fade away in a year like uh, metaverse and NFT stuff and uh, all the things that were big hype last year? I don't think so at all, but I'm guessing that you agree. I want to see. It. Well, um, let me start by uh, just. It's going to sound like I'm trying to make myself sm sound smart. It's not that, but probably, I don't know, 12 or 15 months ago, um, I banned the use of the word metaverse inside of Unity because I thought it was silly. <laughs> um, and um, it felt to me that, look, I, to, be, to be honest with you, I was proud of the fact that when you know Facebook would hold a, a big event, and they'd show a whole lot of XR content that seven, eight times out of 10, what they showed, including Horizon World, was built in Unity. Now, I, I liked that. Um, I never had a desire to join Mark and, and, and Horizon and never would. I mean, I tried it, but it wasn't something I thought was a particularly compelling idea. And I never really thought these sort of vague notions of a metaverse were a very good idea. Uh, now, we do work outside of gaming, and um, a digital twin is what we talk about, um, which sounds very pedestrian, but it does realize 3D worlds outside of gaming in a way that's very you know high utility, and they can do simulation in parallel. Whether it's the you know the, the city where Orlando uses this, or a city replica, you know multiple airports do, you know auto manufacturing lines. There's a really important set of use cases there. The idea that I want to move into someone's you know fantasized metaverse has never appealed to me. Now, the, the word is also applied to gaming, and, and, and maybe it's apt. Um, I remember reading you know, Snow Crash when it first came out, and I was inspired by it. And it seemed like everybody I knew was starting a, a game studio with you know, names like Black Sun and other things that were sort of <laughs> referenced in the book as cool, cool places to go. I think it was a bar. And, um, if I remember correctly, it was a long time ago. But anyway, so, um, like whoever asked this question, uh, I thought Metaverse was silly. And so, and you'll notice at Unity, we never made any substantial, and I'm another controversial thing that, that I'm going to say that someone's going to hate me for, but um, we never made substantial investments around Web3 either. Um, because as much as I you know, think blockchain technology is cool and it, it probably has lots of effective use cases, um, I never really saw any of the currencies actually being currencies. They seem like speculative investments. I can't, you know, easily, you know, buy a loaf of bread with a, with a, any of the cryptocurrencies. That I mean it's not a currency, in my opinion. Um, it didn't say it's not an interesting area for technical exploration and maybe some businesses of sustaining value will be created there. I haven't seen a lot of those yet. So there's a, a reason for someone to ask me questions to be cynical about all sorts of the next wave that's supposed to be important. And I get. You could put Metaverse up there. Um, you could certainly put Web3 up there. I could probably list 15 other things that have hit the industry that you could put up there. Um, you could even put you know, the broader definition of XR up there because while I'm a real believer that XR is cool, I don't think it becomes in this decade any bigger than, say, game consoles. And some people picture it to be um, as, as prevalent or as high penetration as, as, as smartphones. And I don't see that happening either. So. Um, like whoever asked this question, Mr. Anonymous or Ms. Anonymous, um, I too am skeptical. Um, the reason um, I tell you that Unity is not jumping on the bandwagon is we really have been doing this for five years. Um, it has continued to surprise us in how much value it adds to the development and creation process. Um, it actually has high utility. It, it, it's, it achieves the metaphoric, you know, ability to say buy a loaf of bread. You can actually do something with it as opposed to, you know, most cryptocurrencies. And we haven't really gotten to why AI will enable games that are better or different than they've been up until now. And we should talk about that. But we're into this because we've been in it. I mean, calling us jumping on the bandwagon. Um, I think we helped start the bandwagon. Um, or maybe we put wheels on the bandwagon long before it was a bandwagon by enabling things inside of Unity. And um, I also believe it's going to take us to a pretty good place in terms of new games. So no, I don't think it's fair to say we're jumping on the bandwagon.
Yeah, I agree. I didn't know before um, the insider thing that I got to see a couple of weeks ago that Unity had been working on AI stuff for so long. I knew that there was a little AI stuff going on there. I didn't realize the scope of it, but it is actually, I, w- I was surprised and impressed when I got to see the demos. Um, I would really, well, oh, I, yeah, actually, I just really love to hear about um, what you think AI is going to do, though, to enable new games. So if you can, before we go on to the next question, just talk about that for a second, because you've kind of mentioned it a bit about the new types of things that you think are going to be available or possible. I'd love to hear what you kind of envision there, if you have anything in mind. I've got something very clear in mind. And um, if there's anybody out there listening today that designs games for a living, um, I invite you to think about this, you know, when I'm about to describe carefully. And it, you might have already thought about it, but so I'm not here to tell you that I've got the first, the first thesis. But um, for any of us that have played, you know, open world games or sports games or, you know, RPGs or such in, in many, many genres, there are NPCs in these games. And, you know, the, you know, we all like, to complain about how the NPCs in our favorite sports games are dumb or in, you know, oh, I found the repetitive pattern in the, my favorite shooter or whatever it happens to be. And, mm-hmm. and, and why is that? Because the AI implemented by game studios is pretty primitive. You know, they use rubber banding or, you know, they write parameters for what a, what a character can do. Or, you know, if you're playing GTA and you're, you know, holding up a liquor store, you know, Sam and, and Dan, you know, provided for six scenarios. You know, the guy can, run out or pull a gun on you or give you the money. But that's kind of it. There's just like, maybe they wrote 10 scenarios because it goes crazy around you know, getting things just right. But that's all there is. Imagine a world, and I'm going to tell you how this can happen pretty much exactly you know, using Unity technology. Imagine a world where every NPC, and again, everyone if you want them to be, has a backstory, has um, ambitions, um, so you know kind of where they come from and what they might otherwise want. But no developer's written a line of dialogue for them. None. They haven't told them what to do. Um, I'll tell you how they get smart in a minute. And as a player, you can stop and talk to them and have an inter- interesting conversation about most anything. A sports game where you can walk in the stadium, you know, grab some you know, person looking fairly athletic and drag them out on the field and see how they play. Imagine games that are that alive. Imagine, you know, you know, in your in some future version of BTA, you walk in to rob that hypothetical. Uh, liquor store, and instead of uh, you know having the transaction that you expect to happen, this guy says, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a wannabe bad guy. Um, can I join your crew? And suddenly you've got a posse that wasn't considered by anybody that was involved in building that game. So we can start to build world. Imagine some future, I don't know, Godfather movie or Godfather game. The world is so alive that even when you're not playing the game, just wandering around and going into bars and playing pool with people is part of what it is. You, these worlds are alive. My sense is when we build games like this, and we will, when you will, people are going to want to move into these worlds and probably live in them. Now, I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that I, I'm 100% sure there's nothing but positive social consequence in that. Um, you know, we may create a whole world of people that think they're in the, in the, you know, at the holodeck and they're never going to leave. Um, but it's our, probably our ambition, our destiny to make these things. I think it, it goes the last mile towards replacing yet another giant amount of linear content by the kind of work you guys are going to do. So those worlds I want to live in, a world where the NPCs uh, in a battle game are... They can do most anything, and the game can be that much more surprising, delightful, and exciting for that. Now, how will that happen? Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, the developers are going to create a backstory and a set of ambitions um, for each of those characters. And then just like a large language model, you know, started to work when the transformer technology made it possible to study all the available data, they're just going to be smart. They're going to be able to talk to you like you're talking to a chat, but they'll do it in character um, if that's what the developer provides for. And they'll be able to do anything in character. Now, we're going to get into this capability inch by inch, step by step. It all won't happen overnight. I remember you know, the first time I played open world games, I think for me, that would have been GTA 3. Uh, like the possibilities blew my mind. But you know, putting aside that those possibilities blew my mind, 
This is a bigger step towards worlds feeling alive than anything we've ever seen before. I think that's super exciting. Now, this is what we were thinking about in that bar when I was talking to Silvio over five years ago about putting an inference engine inside the runtime. Now, we hadn't imagined that AI at that time would be what it's being talked about today. And a lot of it on smoke at people, but there's a lot of incredible things going on there. Um, we just thought what I just described was destined to be. And what we wanted to do, because we realized that, you know, I don't want every game to create a $50 million AWS bill, that we're going to want to be able to do it on device, which means we need an inference engine in the runtime. So much of the compute that would facilitate that type of interaction can happen on these devices uh, versus the ones that, um, you know, people like, you know, Sundar and, 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 and Andy Jassy are running at, at your expense. Not that I have anything against, you know, cloud compute, but it's expensive. And it also introduced latency and it introduces things that you're not going to want in your game. So I am so incredibly excited about that. And, you know, I've talked to, I talked to half a dozen developers at GDC about it. And I have to admit, a couple of them looked at me cross-eyed like they, I, I wasn't explaining it very well or they just weren't going to get there. But then a couple I spoke to thought, oh my God, how, how do I meet Luke, back to our CTO, your first question, like in the next 10 minutes to figure out how I can be an early user of, of Barracuda um, because they want that. Um, I don't know what other game breakthroughs will come from it, but we have long wanted worlds that are really alive. We've any game developers dreamed about it. Um, that, that's at least been exploring that side of their creativity. It's gonna happen, and I think it's one of those things. You know, kind of like the internet changes everything, and I'm super excited about it. Yeah, me too. I think that it's like said going to change everything, and the idea um, of having NPCs like this is going to drastically change the way that we put things together. And it, it actually, the question I've been trying not to ask you is about holodecks. <laughs> so it ties right in. Uh, I'm just curious, do you think that end result of this, not maybe not in the next uh, couple of decades, but long term is going to be more like that, where the game developer is essentially telling the, the system, hey, we're making this build out this entire world. Maybe it's not all holographic and around them at first, but it's you know 3D and on the screen, and then well, hopefully one day soon in the future it's holographic and uh, we don't accidentally get plugged in and forget that we're plugged in. Which I always well, worry too. Like decades, maybe I am plugged in and months. I just don't know it. <laughs> think about months, not decades though, Jason. So this will be happening starting now, and people will ship products that are starting to you know get there. I believe in 24 and certainly in 25. But let me just give you one more thought, because I think it's a super interesting one. Because it might give you a sense of how this will come together. And it's a very mundane fact. So today, many developers will put out a, a beta version of their game, or they'll test it in a limited geography, and they'll use that to tune the game where they've hard-coded you know, that liquor store robbery scenario to see how players play it and, and get it just right or get the balance in a multiplayer just right. And so they need humans pounding on it because they're going to hard code something in that game to facilitate something that might feel broken or wrong to the players. And games often get, well, not always, sometimes they stay broken, but often they go from a state where they're pretty good, but it's a lot broken to something really much better by the time they do, you know, full commercial release. If you build a game the way I've just described it, where the world's alive, we're going to do something really different and a little bit strange. You're going to ship a game with dumb NPCs, smarter than, you know, probably your, your average person that I run into on the streets around here. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be what you want them to be. And what your player community is going to do is they're going to play that game, the beta users, and by their way of playing it and by their interactions, train the NPCs in the same way the first 10 million people train chat GPT. ChatGPT's um, accuracy and intelligence it went from like an IQ of 20 to an IQ of 160 in the process of the first 10 million people pounding on it. And so what's going to happen, and of course, developers are going to want what's come constraints so games don't become impossible. But again, that's part of our job. But 
the worlds are going to get smart. The NPCs, by the way, fire can be an NPC. Uh, weather can be an NPC, uh, depending on the game you're building, right? Anything can be an NPC in the way I'm describing any system. And so when we imagine, I mean, I can't wait to be a beta tester for someone that's decided that weather systems are an NPC or that any of the things that might be emergent in gameplay might be an NPC. And so light your imagination on fire because wouldn't it be fun while the game is dumb? I mean, I always loved, you know, like, I don't know, I, back to GT, I remember, you know, jumping my car into the water and realized it can drive under the water. Like, really? I mean, things like that, they didn't anticipate, you know, to a point that it kind of got, didn't go anywhere anymore. They didn't put a collision detection system up. I could do something. But regardless of that, isn't it going to be fun to jump into these worlds while they're learning to be the worlds that you as a creator envision? Um, it's another stage of development and one that I think is going to be one of the reasons the game industry is going to jump forward is we're going to invite, there's, a, you know, there's hundreds of millions of console and PC gamers, there's billions of, of, of mobile gamers, and they're going to want to get into these worlds and they're going to understand finally part of what we as you as creators do because they're going to be involved in the process of training. Like I, we all had more fun with large language models when we could talk them into their alter egos. You know, can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, every time we build a game, we're going to go through this process. I think it's going to be, um, we're going to be back in the front page news every time we release a game. And I mean, I want to be part of it. And I think a lot of the folks listening, I hope, will find maybe just a spark there to, to think about. Because I'm sure my imagination didn't carry me far enough but it's a lot further than we've been so far on this point. Yeah, you've inspired me already. So I've got a, a couple ideas bouncing around in my head. I want to go try out later tonight. If I, if I'm not too tired when I get home, I'm gonna uh, I want to start experimenting, writing some things down because yeah, this is this is really exciting. All right, let's go on. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, cool. and this one was with the recent acquisitions. It seems like. The only one rapidly integrated was Iron Source, but properties like Speed Tree, Weta, and Ziva Dynamics are mostly and mums the word. And they want to know why does Unity not tout their successes in the films industry more publicly? Um, That's from Etonic. Well, uh, again, uh, great question. And you know, I've been first off pretty heavy-handed on do amazing things and don't brag about doing amazing things. Um, Second point I'd make to you is like if you, if anybody saw the incredible demo we did at um, Seagraph with the lions and the twenty million hair follicles on those things, that was a combination of Weta and Ziva tools um, and traditional Unity tools brought together and AI overlays to create that that demo. And so it's not that hard to create. It was done relatively quickly, and we did tout it a lot at Seagraph if you were there. Um, and so you know, against the narrow audience, we do that. Um, and by the way, we're doing a lot of work right now in bringing our first customers onto Weta. You know, it was originally a tool only really used by Weta FX, and we're bringing our first customers on it now. There's AI tools embedded there to enable people to do more, better, faster. Um, and so, um, to answer your question, we're really proud of SpeedTree, Weta, Ziva. Um, you know, and we probably should talk more about them and will. So, appreciate the advice implicit in the question. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely good. I think a lot of people still don't know. It's funny. I was at Universal Studios uh, last week with the kids and going through the the one of the things that was built by Weta on the tour. And I was talking to my wife. I was like, "Yeah, Unity actually acquired that company and is uh, putting their stuff into their tools." She's like, "What? I didn't know." I mean, my wife's not going to know, but still, it was a uh, it was interesting that to just, just seeing it out there. And I'm kind of excited about it. I think we've got time for uh, one more question. So why don't we pop it up? I, th I think we do. Do we have another question popping up, Joe? I'm looking for it. Ah, there we go. How do you see the role of Unity shaping in the future of VR? And what are your plans for advancing VR technology? So um, the first thing, and hey, Bob, um, the first thing I'd say is that um, VR is a, a lot like sort of the first question we got. 
you know, one of those technologies that sort of got an insane amount of, of, of PR. And, you know, I remember when Oculus won, I think it was two CES events in a row was in the technology of the, of the event. And, um, and yet still hasn't really, um, you know, a decade plus on, hasn't really yielded the, the most fantastical of, of, of expectations people had for it. And um, in fact, in that time frame, I gave a, a well-covered presentation called The Gap of Disappointment, where I said it was going to be a much longer to realize its, its future than some analysts mm-hmm. were projecting with the trillion-dollar marketplaces out there. And so one could have called me, even though I was pretty close to the team at Oculus, um, one could have called me a VR skeptic. Uh, now I'm a, a VR optimist. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see the seeds of really good product out there. Good hardware, you know, some, some development of products that I think are, you know, software products that are going to make these things really exciting. Um, and so um, count me as the industry's finally caught up to its promise. And, and that will be manifest in, you know, the next couple of years. Um, you know, we'll see product announcements and, and on the development side, the hardware side, they're going to be pretty exciting. Um, now, one of the things that I'm always stuck with on situations like this is Unity is often very deep in uh, tech stack and working on the tech stack for any new hardware that's coming out uh, because the creators of, of hardware want their, their tool, their, their hardware to work with the leading software development platform the moment it hits, you know, the shelves. So I'm, I'm often, you know, I don't know, it seems like my office could be wallpapered in NDAs. And so I can't <laughs> often get into many specifics. Um, but we are a, a real believer that VR is going to be a meaningful, you know, XR, because I think there's a lot of AR and VR out there, and there's going to be lots of different hardware devices out there. I'm a real believer that it's going to find its way. Um, I think it's going to be a big deal. And you know, two out of three times today, if anything is built in, in any XR device, it's, it's built on Unity today. And we do a lot of work in that area. And, you know, one of the things I'd encourage, you know, Jason, if you wanted to, is we can get some of our technical folks um, to do an interview with you um, where they can go quite deep on aspects of what we're doing on the technology. But, you know, suffice it to say that, um, you know, we're, we're real believers. We're investing pretty heavily in the space. Um, it have been for a long time, but sometimes these things aren't as visible um, externally as they are emphasized inside of Unity, and they're, they're going to find their day. Well, I think that's exciting for all the uh, VR developers out there. And I've done a bunch of VR stuff in the past and kind of fallen off, and I was looking at getting back into it actually right around this time. My son just got an index, and he's super excited about it. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive back in and, and do a little bit of VR stuff, and I'm excited to see... Uh, I oh, would dive into some of the new Unity things. And I'm also excited that you see it as a positive future because I felt like I was super over-optimistic and then crushed. And then I tried to get a little bit more realistic <laughs> with, uh, with my expectations. Um, and I just try to, st- I try to stop predicting things and I'm just going to start following your predictions from now on because I'm always wrong and you seem to be right about just about everything so far. So it looks like we got one last question we got time for and it's, what would you say are Unity's greatest strengths and weaknesses compared to other game engines? This is a interesting one. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll start with you know one of the challenges that's unique to Unity. So um, we're often compared to tools like Unreal. Um, you know, sometimes to Cocos, but more often we're compared to Unreal. And North of 70% of mobile games are built in Unity, and I don't know, half a percentage of the games are built on, on Unreal. And, you know, we're, we've also grown from kind of not such an important position in console gaming and PC gaming to being the leading, you know, third party engine on, on these platforms um, with, you know, 20, 30, 50 plus market shares against the consoles. And if you look at Steam, you know, in a given month and, and look at, you know, the top 20 titles, it's been a long time since it's not at least half of them built in Unity. And by the way, to all you DOTS developers out there, every month more and more um, DOTS-based games there. And so, um, I, know, I hate quoting Spider-Man, but 
I mean, with great power comes great responsibility. But the analog of that is we get exposed to more use cases than any development engine on the planet by orders of magnitude. And that it's very hard to be good at everything. And the challenge to be good at everything, because people have the expectation that no matter what they're doing, some you know very narrowly targeted XR product, a, a DOTS product that wants to do something very specific against a high-end PC, photorealistic graphics, et cetera, all of those expectations are on our shoulders, and we happily accept them. But because of those literally millions of, of, of products that are built, um, you know, people trying to get things in, out of Unity, um, we fall short um, because maybe we're not moving fast enough and we're working hard to move faster, um, but because they're just the expectations live everywhere. So let me start with our, our weaknesses and then move on to our strengths. So I think our weakness, um, it, and most people would say, if you wanted to build a photorealistic FPS, I would argue you, you, you pull up Unreal, and that's pretty much what it is. It's a photoreal FPS builder right out of the box. Um, it's almost on Rails to do that. Unity's exactly the opposite of that. We're not on, the, on Rails to make anything. We're a very broad tool that can make almost anything, but we're not as specialized to make one thing. We're the breadth to make anything. And um, our strength really is we're the easiest to use. We're the most extensible. Um, our technology gets people to the most platforms most successfully. So those are our strengths. But what's interesting, and, and I think you know, maybe a disadvantage, because you know, people ask me why we don't tout our successes more, um, what we get compared to, and that comparison is a tough one, is we often get compared where let's find what the very narrow tool is best at and compare that to a broader tool that is designed to do everything. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to call, you know, first, I, I have nothing but admiration for, for Tim and the, you know, the team there. So, you know, they make a beautiful product. So that's not, I'm not here to criticize them. I'm just saying that I think our greatest weaknesses is maybe we don't talk enough about the fact that comparisons the ones that make us look on a relative basis weaker are really about a narrow strength against a broad tool. And I think maybe too much we've allowed that comparison to live in the minds of our developers. But all of you that are Unity developers out there understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that that nailed it. And um, I think you kind of really, really laid out the differences. I think that Unity... Um, when you say that it's got the broadest use case, that so you're not... It's, Far from an exaggerate, like Unity is, I see it used for all kinds of things. It's a, a ridiculous number of use cases. I see enterprise stuff, game stuff, and everywhere else. And um, yeah, I'm kind of like you. I, I love Unreal, worked in it a long time. And if I have friends that are building an FPS, I say, hey, if you know Unreal, go, go use that. If you're building something else, I'd say, go, or go to Unity. Go just about it. Or dots, yeah. Hey, we'll <laughs> or dots. And then what you get is native multiplayer capability and dots a data-oriented stack that runs against the GPU more efficiently, and you can realize more complex worlds than in any other tool on the planet. So you might want to now start using us there. But um, that's probably I, another I, interview in no time. I think it, that's definitely one uh, worth doing it and probably get Laurent in there to talk about it too, because I think that that's a, a very solid point. Now the DOTS is 1.0, it's time for me to um, start switching my recommendation. All right, well, thank you very much, John. This was awesome. I had a great time. I was super nervous about it, but other than that, I had a great time talking to you. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that everybody uh, watching learned a lot and got a lot out of it. So thank you very much. We really appreciate everything that you do and everything that the team at Unity does to make all this stuff possible and make it so that we can all build games and do what we love. So thanks again. Thanks, Jason, and thanks to all you Unity developers out there. We live for you. <laughs>